Well, welcome everyone to Hope Church this morning. Um, if we were a ship, we would be listing heavily onto this side. Um, but uh, maybe that will get balanced out later on. I don't know what's wrong with this side. Um, well, we are, we're back in John's Gospel uh, this morning. Uh, we're nearly at the end. Um, we'll have the final part of this um, after Easter. But uh, then this morning we have, it's the first Sunday of the month, um, it's a bring your own lunch, and then we're going to have a time of sharing prayer and the Lord's Supper. And this week uh, we have our growth groups meeting. <clears throat> um, there's more information about that on the bulletin, and uh, that you'll be contacted separately about that. And this is uh, Easter week, so on Friday we have uh, an extra service, a Good Friday service at 10.30. On Saturday, we're out in town uh, at the Thamesgate Centre. We've got a stall there all day. And then on Sunday, we have our uh, Easter Day family service. And there are these uh, invites, which I haven't got, which are on your seats, um, which we can use. And there's also going to be a lunch next Sunday. So we need people to sign up for that. And to uh, we need plenty of food. We hope we can have visitors. So let's make sure we've got enough food for everyone. And uh, with the extra stuff we're doing on Friday and Saturday, we won't then have, uh, we'll have a week off from the Bible study next Sunday. Okay, well, let's read uh, God's word as we begin. From the beginning of John's gospel, this uh, introduces themes that John comes back to in the passage we're going to be looking at towards the end of John's gospel. And it also connects, you should recognize that this connects to what we were looking at in the very first chapter of the Bible, in Genesis 1. So let's read these verses as we come to worship God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was, there was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, nor a husband's will, but born of God. The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Well, let's come now to uh, sing a song that uh, echoes those themes. We sing of what Jesus has done in creation, in the cross, and in his resurrection, all so that we can be brought back to God and to know him and to be saved. Stop. 
Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we praise you for these incredible words that we have sung this morning. We have miracle upon miracle. The incredible reality that Jesus of Nazareth, the one born in Bethlehem, the one who grew up like any other Jewish boy, that that man is the Son of God, the Word of God, the one who has always existed, the one who has made everything, the one who today upholds every atom in the universe, every cell in our body is in his hands. And he is the one who stilled the storm, he fed the hungry, and most incredibly of all, he went to the cross. And he did that to save the lost. He, he stilled the storm, he fed the hungry, and we thank you that he went to the cross so that we can be saved, so that there can be forgiveness, so that the guilty can go free. We thank you that he rose again from the dead. We thank you that he uh, conquered death to be raised to this new resurrection life. And we thank you that we know all of this because you have told us, because you have revealed this in your word. You have revealed your glory as we were thinking on Wednesday evening. You, you, you revealed your glory telling us who you are, what you have done. There's nothing vague about your revelation. You tell us bluntly exactly who you are and exactly why we need you. And we pray, Lord, that you would give us hearts to hear you speaking today. We thank you that you speak afresh through your word, and we pray that we would have the humility to listen to you, to, um, to not think that we know better than you, to, to sort of think, well, this is what you really mean, or, or uh, well, we don't really quite agree with what you're saying there, Lord. Give us those hearts that would actually listen to what you are really saying, and to submit to that, to see that you are the living God whose words we must obey, and that you give us these words because you want to give us life, that there is life found through your word. And we pray that even today we would see uh, that, that new creation work as you uh, come by your spirit to make people born again, to make them new creations in Christ. We pray, Lord, that we would see something of the power of your word today. And Lord, help us where we're already along that way, where we have received that life in Jesus. We pray that your words today would strengthen us, would reassure us, would empower us, would enable us to persevere, to carry on walking with you, to know that we are held by you. Lord, we thank you that you work through your word. We thank you that we can hear that afresh today, that we can be gathered here as your people to hear your word. And Lord, we pray, may we know the power of your spirit here today. Work amongst us. Have mercy on us. May we take seriously what we are doing, gathering as your people, that Jesus is here amongst us. May we take that seriously, for we ask it in his name. Amen. Well, let's come uh, to our second reading this morning. Um, our first reading helps us to understand what's going on in this second reading. And we're in, um, if you've got, on these question sheets we, uh, we give out, um, if there's things that have come up there or just other stuff that's come up through this series, we've got the opportunity in three weeks' time, uh, in our time of discussion after the service, uh, to, to look over this whole series on John. So if you've got questions on that, then, or things you want to pick up on, then that's something we can do in, in three weeks' time. Now... What we're picking up on here is what we were doing two weeks ago when we looked, began to look at the resurrection. 
Jesus was buried after his crucifixion on the Friday evening. And then on Sunday morning, the tomb was empty. Well, it was empty apart from the grave clothes. The point was there was no Jesus. So let's pick up now what happens after that point. They found the empty tomb. So John 20, verse 10. Then the disciples went back to their homes, but Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white, seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they've put him. At this, she turned round and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. Woman, he said, why are you crying? Who is it that you're looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him and I will get him. (coughs) Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned towards him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said, do not hold on to me, for I have not yet returned to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am returning to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news. I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. (laughs) On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together, with the doors locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone his sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now, Thomas, called Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe it. A week later, his disciples were in the house again and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written, that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. I meant to ask before then, um, to count up how many times Jesus says peace to the disciples in that passage. I don't know if you can, if you spotted that. Yeah. Three, brilliant. It's three times. Keeps repeating it. It's as if he wants us uh, to really take him seriously on that. We'll look at that a bit later. But um, first of all, have a think about what John uh, was writing here. 
Okay, when you're, when you're at school um, and you sometimes have to do a sort of piece of writing, maybe you're having to sort of read some stuff and then, and then write about it um, yourself. Do you ever hear the teacher saying something like this? I, I want this to be, to be your own work. Um, don't, don't just copy it. Um, you need to use your own words. Has any teacher ever said that to you? Yeah? Good. That's, uh, it's still, it happens all the way through education. Um, Use your own words. Well, what do you, re what do you make of this? Um, who's, who's this guy? Prince Thank you, it's Prince Harry, yeah. Well, I was, it's a strange way my mind works. Um, when I saw uh, these displays up in the supermarket, of, well, it's quite a little while ago now, isn't it? A couple of months ago. I was a bit intrigued by this, this advert, um, which says, his words, his story. Well, it certainly is his story. Whether it's history is another matter, um, but it certainly is his story. But it's not his words, because it's perfectly public knowledge, and it's a perfectly common thing, and, and it's a perfectly okay thing to do, is he had someone called a, a ghost writer, which is a slightly strange thing. It's not, it's not someone that's a ghost. Um, it's not even someone writing about ghosts. It's someone who is maybe better at writing than Prince Harry. I mean, maybe Harry's a great writer, I, I don't know. But um, someone that's meant to be better at writing that basically helps him put a book together. So, yeah, he's telling his story, but the words are coming from a guy called J.R. Moeringer. He's the writer. So it's his story... It's not actually his words. And the way, strange way my mind works, I remember thinking, well, how does that compare to the Bible? Because look at what we have in, in John's Gospel. Who wrote John's Gospel? Well, in the chapter we've got coming after what we read, it says this, this is the disciple who testifies to these things and who wrote them down. So, this is John, I believe, the disciple who had lived alongside Jesus. He saw all of these things, and he wrote them down. He's saying, this is what I saw. These are John's words. But here's the amazing thing. So, we're reading John's words here. We pick up John's gospel. But the amazing thing is they are also God's words spent another hour, I could um, show you this in lots and lots of ways, but all, all the books in the Bible are God's words. It is God speaking. Let me just give you one example of that, where we're told that. Jeremiah, the prophet, says, the Lord reached out his hand and touched my mouth and said to me, now I have put my words in your mouth. Isn't that wonderful? So God could have just spoken himself. But instead, he puts his words in Jeremiah's mouth. So Jeremiah is speaking. It's Jeremiah's words. But the words that Jeremiah is speaking and that he's writing down in his prophecy are God's words. The prophet's words are God's words. In John's gospel, the words that John writes are John's words, but they're also God's words. And that's something we're told time and time again. You could almost say the... No, I won't say that. Right. Um, so the Bible here is, is God's story. And it's in God's words. And that means we can trust it. It's true. Because if it's God's words, God can't lie. So this is why we can absolutely trust what is in the Bible, because it's not simply John's words, it's God's words. And it means when we read the Bible, something utterly incredible is happening. We are hearing God speaking to us. If you were here in time this morning, you would have heard God's voice this morning. What a thing to have missed. God's voice speaking to us. That's what we were doing as we read scripture. That is God's voice speaking to us. 
And so this is what we had in our reading. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. You see, John's dead. We can't hear John's voice, if you like, now. But God is very much alive, and he is speaking to us today, and he is giving us these words. This is God speaking to us today, that these words that we have read, why have they been given to us? It's because he wants you to have life. What an incredible thing. So, take the Bible seriously. It's God's words. It's his story. Let's uh, sing this uh, song now that speaks of the life that Jesus gives. Jesus gives life. Life to the full. Beginning right now and going forever. Jesus gives life the best kind of love, a friendship with God that nothing can sever. And uh, fortunately we have... uh, Uh, Julia's recording to help us sing this this morning. So let's stand and sing. Well, Mary was a witness of what she had seen as she encountered Jesus. And that is actually what those of us that are Christians here this morning are too. We are witnesses of Jesus, that we also have met him. And that's why we have um, these uh, invitation cards, these on your seats. There's plenty more at the back. This is for our service next Sunday, um, particularly designed for people that maybe never heard this stuff before. It's all a bit new. What a great opportunity to, for people to hear of the good news of Jesus' resurrection. And we're doing a lunch as well next Sunday. Please sign up to help uh, with that so that we can give people a good welcome. And we're doing the stall on Saturday, uh, as I've mentioned numerous times. Hopefully this isn't news to you. Um, and um, if you're able to... More helpers are always, always a good thing. Okay, to have more people amongst us. And uh, if you're able to help with this, uh, please sign up on the sheet at the back. And the other way that um, you can help is uh, if, if anyone wants to put some stickers, we've got some, some more sort of some of the books we're going to give out. We need to put some stickers on them. If anyone wants to help with that after the service, um, please come and find me. There's uh, plenty of that to do. Another way to contribute and to help. And please pray for that work. You can't be there. Please pray that God would work through that. And then the other thing I wanted to mention uh, is is this booklet here from the FIEC, the Fellowship of Independent Evangelical Churches. That's a national network of churches that we belong to, around 600 churches or so across the country. And you'll know all about this because you'll all have read the prayer bulletin. Um, There's copies of this at the back if you didn't get one by email. But if you did, I'm sure you've read it so you know all about this. And I get someone to come up and tell me what it said. Um, Why are we giving these out? Well, it's partly so that we can sort of be a bit inspired to find out what is going on. What are other churches around the country doing? We're not on our own. And we can pray for for those things going on. And um, to see that, you know, this is something that, that we share in together. But perhaps the other thing that I... That I thought would be worth giving this out, and this is, this is more dangerous, really, is that it might give us some ideas. And the danger of that is that people come along and say, 
oh yeah, yeah, we should do whatever. And often what people mean by that is you, as in pastor or someone else, should do these things. Well, this is a great idea, you know, maybe you should do that. Um, well, maybe that's true, but I'm probably not going to listen very much if that's what people are saying. But if you come to me and say, look, I've been thinking about this. I've been talking to some others in the church. This is something that really fits the gifts we have here. This is something we could actually do, you know, using the facilities here or whatever. This is a need. God's laid this on our heart. Is this something the church could come behind? If people come along like that, then I absolutely need to be all ears. You know, maybe, maybe there's ways we, you know, it's very easy to be comfortable, isn't it, in just how we do things. We've got our lives all, you know, difficulties in their own ways. But the needs around us are massive. And God has called us to serve him. He's called us to lay down our lives for him. Which, at the very least, means it's not all about us. It's not all about me and my comfort, what I like, sorting out my life. That isn't what Jesus has called us to. So it's a real challenge, and I'm slightly scared saying this, what might come back, but that's what God has called us to. So there we go. That's, uh, I've put this out to get you to scare me. So do take one of those, and let's, let's pray about these things now. Pray for that ministry and pray for our work in the church. Our Heavenly Father, we do pray for our nation we're conscious of massive needs around us across this nation, but yes, even just in this locality. Who knows what things people have been through even in the last 24 hours? What tragedies and breakups, what fear, what hopelessness, what loneliness. Lord, you know the burdens, the, some of the darkness that people are experiencing and we thank you that you have given us the answer in the Lord Jesus we thank you that he is the ultimate answer to all that we face and even where people don't realize it that that the it ultimately our problems come from not knowing you from having turned away from you we thank you that Jesus comes as the saviour to, to deal with that, to put things right, to give us a fresh start, to bring transformation. And we thank you that we have this gospel. And we thank you for churches up and down this nation that are preaching that gospel. Lord, thank you there are churches working in places of deprivation, in places of affluence, people working with refugees, people working with all sorts of other needs. Heavenly Father, we ask that we would see a new empowering through your gospel, a new, a new drawing of people to yourself. Lord, we pray for a spirit of repentance in this land. Lord, what a prayer to pray. That seems almost ludicrous to pray that when we consider the, the, the arrogant way people speak against you and against your word. But we thank you that you are greater than all of that. And we pray, Lord, that you would be using even some of the struggles that we are going through at this time, that you might use that to humble people and to... Bring them to see that what they have rejected is actually the very thing that they need. So, Lord, work amongst us as a nation. Work amongst us as churches. Give us that heart for the lost. And we pray that we would want to serve you. And, Lord, thank you for what you have done for us as a church. Thank you for how you have kept us, how you've provided for us. Thank you for this opportunity we have on Saturday. And we ask, Lord, that you would prepare people for us to meet. Lord, overall, the interactions, the conversations, give us, help us to know how to engage with people, help us to know what to say, how to truly connect, and above all, how to show that what we are offering is not, is not simply books or religion, it is Jesus himself. And we pray, Father, that we would see coming, people coming amongst us on Sunday 
to hear this good news of what Jesus has done. May we see Jesus' resurrection power in saving people in these days. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, it's going to be uh, time now for the younger ones to go to junior church. And we're going to um, sing this hymn uh, while that's happening. This is one of my favorite favorite hymns, How Firm a Foundation, You Saints of the Lord. What I love about this is it captures the reality of Christian living. Basically, Christian living is a life and death struggle, but with a certain outcome. And that is what uh, we get so encouraged by in this, uh, in this hymn. So let's, uh, let's stand and sing this together. How firm a foundation, you saints of the Lord. shut the door at the, the back there. Yeah. Okay, well here are some words. Um, they're on a fence very near here, uh, on a building site that's next to the Woodville Halls. I think it's where the old police station used to be. That was uh, just about disbanded when we arrived in Gravesend. And it says this, enjoy an independent, secure, and fulfilling lifestyle. What's that an advert for? Well, they're building retirement homes. So these words are giving you information. Homes 
are being built. And they're promising you something. They're promising a sort of transformation, even a sort of new creation, in the sense that what is now a building site, what is, what is heaps of earth, is going to become something else. And they're also promising a future for you. They're trying to make a connection with you, aren't they? They're trying to get you to feel something. Because the whole point is you want security. You want independence. You want fulfillment. So by putting these words together, they're wanting you to do something. They want you to invest, to buy one of these properties, or maybe, if it's not something for you at the moment, to tell someone else about them. You know, have you seen these new homes that they're building? And maybe I'll get a commission for this extra advertising that I'm giving them. But it's just seven words, but they're doing a lot, aren't they? Words are very powerful. Words bring change. You know, sometimes we say, oh, it's just words. Well, that's not often true. It's never just words. Think of these two words, just three letters. These two words at a wedding can change the course of your life. I do. And we see something very similar in John chapter 20. There are lots of words here. Jesus is speaking lots of words. People are telling others about what Jesus has said. And then we have these words written down for us in verse 31. But these are written, that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. In other words, these are words that give life, that create new life. Words that restore something that has been lost. Words that are the start of a new relationship. They are life-creating words. And I want you to see how this sort of fits in this whole sort of series of sermons we've done on these final chapters of John. As we've looked at Jesus' arrest, his trial, his crucifixion, his resurrection, we've seen how John is describing real events He's telling us what happened. But the way he does that is to constantly make connections to the first chapters in the Bible. It is showing us how Jesus here, these aren't just random events, but Jesus here is putting Genesis 1 to 3 in reverse. I've explained that uh, with lots of examples in previous messages. If you've missed those, you can get that on YouTube. But just think of the cross. The cross was not just was not some sort of random tragic event, but it was what Jesus deliberately went to, deliberately suffering the curse of death, the curse of death that comes from the sin of our first of the first man, our ancestor Adam. Think of the power of words in Adam's life. You see, Adam and Eve believed Satan's words not God's. They believed a lie, that their eyes would be open, that they would gain wisdom. But instead, what was unleashed was all the suffering and death that we see today in our world. You see, false words, lies, bring destruction. But what we have here in John 20 is the very opposite. We have words that bring life. Jesus breathes on his disciples in verse 22. Just as he breathed the breath of life into Adam in Genesis 2.7. And just as Jesus, the creator, spoke words and brought life into creation, those words in Genesis 1, let there be, words that were so powerful, they brought what they said into being, brought life, order and life into being. So here, Jesus' words, words that were written for us, bring eternal life, a new kind of life, a sharing in Jesus' life. 
So these words are very powerful. They are the words of the creator. It is those words we hear afresh today. You know, John opens his gospel, doesn't he, beginning saying that Jesus is the word. And by that he means he is the one who speaks. He is the one who creates. He is the one who shows us God. Because he is God. And the only person who can create life, who can give life, is God. That's why it's only his words that can give life. And that's what I want to try and explain now. So we have, first of all, the words of witness. It matters rather a lot whether these words are true, doesn't it? Everything hangs on this. And if Jesus isn't actually alive, then there's actually no point us being here at all. It's all a lie. So a lot hangs on this. It really matters whether Jesus is alive. And what we have here in this account is evidence of that. How do we know Jesus is alive? Well, one reason is that Mary saw him. Mary was a witness. Mary had seen Jesus crucified and buried on the Friday. And then on the first day of the week, on the Sunday, she sees the stone has been removed. The tomb is empty, or at least empty of a body. There are still burial cloths there, which is rather strange if someone had just taken the body. So she'd seen that. But now she says to the disciples in verse 18, I have seen the Lord. And in fact, she had touched him. She had talked with him the same person who she'd seen crucified. But now he'd been transformed to a new form of life, such that initially she didn't recognize him, as we were thinking a bit about last time. But I want you to understand that Mary here is reporting facts, not feelings. It's not that she's telling the disciples, you know, I I went in that tomb, it, it just felt so empty. You know, yeah, I, I was just a, felt a different person in the garden. It, it, it just, I just, just felt as if Jesus was with me. Sometimes people talk in those ways. That isn't what Mary was saying. The tomb was empty. Jesus was physically with Mary. Whatever she felt or didn't feel, her feelings, in a sense, were irrelevant. These were facts. And so Mary gives what is really the first resurrection sermon. That's quite something, isn't it? On the basis of what she had seen and on the basis of what Jesus had said. And I think this is evidence we need to take seriously because it's not the sort of thing you would make up. At that time, women were not counted as proper witnesses in court. So why on earth make up the the sort of first witnesses of the most important event in Christianity, why make up the first witnesses of those being women? That's a total PR disaster. You know, you're trying to get this new religion going. That is not the sort of thing you would make up. And there's nothing vague about her testimony either. She is reporting Jesus' actual words. It is very striking that... The words that she hears from Jesus, she talks about going to my brothers. And he's talking there about the disciples. Well, that is very odd, because they are never called that before. So again, if you're trying to sort of bring some continuity to what you'd known before, you wouldn't have picked this. And when you read Matthew's account, It's very different. His account of the resurrection feels very different. You sort of think, how does all this fit together? And yet, at this point, it matches exactly what is going on with John. He also calls the disciples brothers. But there's no explanation. Here in John, we are told why. Jesus gives this explanation about, um, I'm returning to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. And we'll, we'll come back to that. But all I want you to see here is that we have one of these sort of undesigned coincidences that are characteristic of true eyewitness testimony, the way these two gospel accounts cohere. 
And there's also something very striking about what Mary says about why Jesus said she shouldn't touch him. Jesus says, do not hold on to me. Do not, um, do not sort of grasp me. Why? He says, um, do not hold on to me, for I have not yet returned to the Father. This response of Jesus is really a bit of uh, in-depth theology of the ascension. And you don't get that from a ghost or from a hallucination. And, and the reason I say it's in-depth is that people have been pondering what Jesus said here down the centuries and, and wondering quite what Jesus meant here. So let me tell you what I think. Um, I think Jesus is saying here, on the one hand, you don't need to cling to me. It's not that I'm about to disappear. I'm not going yet. I've not yet ascended. But on the other hand, don't think, Mary, that this is a return to life before the crucifixion. This is, this is going to something new. You will need to let go. I will be going. I am returning to my father. So, you, so don't cling on. So if you like to Mary, he's saying, don't touch, but tell. That's your job. Go and tell the disciples. To Thomas, he says something rather different. He says, do touch, but also tell. So what's going on with Thomas? Well, he's, a, he's an interesting character, isn't he? Um, he's sometimes called Doubting Thomas, and yet, really, he's no more doubting than any of the other disciples. The real problem with Thomas was that he had missed the meeting. He had missed the gathering of the disciples. And as a result, he'd missed Jesus. Now, this is a slightly uh, off-piste um, application, but it's striking, isn't it? You never know what you're missing if you miss meeting with other disciples, if you miss the gathering of the church. Or for that matter, if you miss some of it, if you're late. I just don't get that. You, know, you can imagine saying to Thomas, oh, you know, Thomas comes in a bit late. Oh, Thomas, you, you've just missed Jesus. But that's what we're doing when we miss the gathering of God's people. And, and Jesus doesn't cater for sort of Thomas individually here. It's not that, that you know, Thomas, oh, you've missed this. It's all right, I'll, I'll, come and, I'll come and see you separately on Monday morning. Thomas has to wait a whole week. That must have been quite a week, doesn't it? He has to wait until they are all gathered together again on the Lord's day. Treasure these times. This is a special thing for us to be gathered together as God's people. We are so casual about it. Because I'll be serious that God is meeting with us when we're here. If we are, then it's going to take, we're going to have to be on an operating theater to be kept away. You know, it's going to have to be something pretty major to keep us away from gathering with God's people. Because Jesus gathers with us. And Jesus here appears with the disciples in a locked room. Again, this resurrection body is different. And he also seems to know exactly what Thomas had said. Even though Jesus hadn't been there physically, he knew what Thomas had said to the other disciples. And so he comes to Thomas and he tells him, touch me. He wants Thomas to be clear that he is the same person that was crucified. He has a real body. He's the same person that Thomas had walked with through those years of discipleship. But then he says this in verse 29. Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. What is Jesus saying there? Blessed are the gullible. Blessed are those who believe without evidence. Blessed are those who ignore the facts. I don't think so. 
Jesus is being real about what is happening here because Jesus is going to ascend to the Father. In other words, the resurrection appearances will stop. And at that point, people are going to need to rely on the evidence of witnesses. Just like we do for any historical event. The whole point about a historical event is that it's in history, it can't be repeated. So how do you know about it? Only from what people tell you about it. And when you think about it, this is actually a good thing. Because it means this message about Jesus can spread as quickly as words can spread. It can spread as far as words can spread. You don't need Jesus' body to touch in order to believe. Jesus' body can only be in one place at a time. You don't need that. You don't need some sort of relic or something. You need this message of the witnesses. And, and there is nothing sort of irrational about this. We rely on witnesses all the time without even thinking about it. Here's an example um, I, I, I came across recently. You know, why do you believe in Australia? Why do I believe in Australia? I've never seen Australia. I've never been there. But you know what? I actually think Australia exists. I actually think there's a country there, and people live there, and they play cricket and everything else. I have faith that it exists, that it's real. Why? Well, from what people tell me. Geography lessons, the television, people who say they used to live there or whatever. Now, it could all be a conspiracy. That is, that is possible. All the pictures could be faked. You can always say that about anything. You could have a, a, an incredibly massive, sophisticated conspiracy. That is always possible. But it's not actually a very rational thing to think. It is far more rational to believe the testimony of multiple reliable people. And that's what we're doing here. Faith is not some leap in the dark. It's not some leap in the dark in the absence of evidence. Faith is trusting someone. And you know what? You don't even have to trust Mary or Thomas. You can go one better than that. It's about trusting Jesus because Jesus is a witness here. Did you notice Jesus does all the talking? Well, that's evidence he's alive, isn't it? In all the resurrection appearances, Jesus talks. He's always explaining what is going on. You know, if Jesus simply appeared without any words, it would be no help, would it? In fact, it would just be weird. You know, who is this? What is this? Why? But Jesus constantly explains. He says this is exactly what he said would happen. Just days before, he'd promised the disciples their tears would turn to joy. And he's keeping his promise. He's a reliable witness. And even more amazingly, what was predicted in the Old Testament, hundreds of years before Jesus was even born, that is fulfilled. We saw that in the crucifixion account, how John shows how what happened in the crucifixion fulfills what God prophesied centuries before. But it's also true. resurrection. The resurrection was really the final sign. John talks about these signs that Jesus did. The resurrection is really the final sign that points to who Jesus is. 
Lloyd will say more about this next Easter service next Sunday, but, but the resurrection isn't just this sort of strange, random miracle. It's the miracle that makes sense of all the others. So Jesus is his own witness. If you say you don't believe or you say, well, there's not enough evidence, your argument isn't really with me. It's with Jesus. You're saying Jesus can't be trusted. And you can't say Jesus, oh, you're a, I think you're a good teacher, and then ignore his teaching on the resurrection. You can't do that. And why would you want to? Because his words are powerful. Look at the transformation that his words bring. Jesus is creating something new. These are words of transformation. Think of the situation it starts from. It starts from something hopeless with darkness and occupied to weeping, fear and doubt. But with Jesus' resurrection, that is transformed to light, an empty tomb, joy, faith, and witness. Jesus starts where we are. He starts in the darkness. But Jesus' resurrection changes everything. Look at four things that Jesus, from Jesus' own words, that of, of transformation that he's promising here. He's talking about us being incorporated into a new family. Verse 17. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am returning to my father and your father, to my God and your God. Before the crucifixion, Jesus had called the disciples, disciples, servants, even friends, but now they're brothers. Do you see the difference? You see, brothers means family. Disciples, servants, friends, they can come and go. A brother is for life. And it's something sort of fixed. You, you may sort of not want to be a brother or something, but you can't stop being a brother. It's just a, a fact about you. And what Jesus is talking about here is something greater than simply a human family. He is talking about being part of God's family. It's what we had at the start of the service, that, that those that believe in his name have the right to become children of God. John 1 verse 12. Born again into a new family. How does this happen? How, how is it that you're a brother? Well, it's by belonging to Jesus, the Son of God. And what he's saying is that the relationship that he has with God the Father... That relationship is shared with his disciples. We call God our Father through Jesus' mouth, I think was Calvin's phrase. That's how close it is. It is we, we talk to God our Father in the same way that Jesus can talk to God his Father. There are no barriers. There is no priest or ritual needed. You are accepted as you are. In Christ, you belong. And this is the most glorious relationship in the universe, the most incredible thing. This is transformation. You have a new, a new position, a new status, a new relationship. And there's peace. Three times Jesus has this greeting on his lips, peace be with you. Again, the very thing he'd promised a few days earlier. And it's more than a greeting you know, sometimes it's, it's not sort of wishful thinking, you know, the sort of have a good day. It's an announcement of mission accomplished. It's a bit like his cry on the cross, it is finished. It is a one word summary of what Jesus has done through his death and resurrection. It's an incredibly rich, beautiful word. Peace really is talking about everything being put right. Everything being put in its right place. It's the very opposite of chaos. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Everything back as it should be. Well, it's about taking things back to how the world was created. In the beginning, there was no suffering. There was no death, no anxiety, no fear, no oppression. 
one theologian put it, it was a spacious and relaxed world. Today we're hemmed in and we're anything but relaxed. But what Jesus is promising here is this peace, and it's peace for the future. It's peace ultimately in a new creation when Jesus returns. But his resurrection marks the beginning of that, the guarantee of that future. How do we know this is going to happen? Well, it's already begun in Jesus' resurrection. And it's a future that is possible because there is now peace with God. See, the whole problem came from the hostility to God. Our sin ultimately reflects hostility to God, rejecting his rule. And the separation from him that, that comes from that leads to death. And that is what Jesus dealt with in his death and resurrection. And so there can be, there can be forgiveness. Jesus gets, sends the disciples out with this promise of, if you, in verse 23, if you forgive anyone his sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. The whole point here is that Jesus is sending out his disciples with this message of what he has done in his death and resurrection, the, the gospel message. That is how forgiveness can be found in what Jesus has done. The disciples can't forgive sin. Only God can. That's why you have this sort of passive um, sense here that, that you know, they are forgiven. They are forgiven by God. The disciples are simply God's agent in bringing this message of where forgiveness can be found. But it's a serious thing because your response to the disciples' message, your response to this gospel determines whether there is forgiveness. If you don't believe, if you don't trust in Jesus, your sins are not forgiven. Your guilt remains. But if you do believe, if you do trust, there is forgiveness. And that is incredible. There is nothing more beautiful than forgiveness. God's forgiveness is the start of something new. You're not going back to the sort of status quo or what things were before. God's forgiveness is not a sort of temporary cleanup until you sin again. And then you're back to square one. It's like sort of snakes and ladders. You go back straight down, uh, down on the snake. It's a permanent state of forgiveness. Sin is never brought up again. They are forever forgiven because they are paid for by Jesus, who is your brother. This is the basis of that new relationship. This is transformation. And the fourth thing is Jesus sends the disciples. He gives them work to do, just like Adam had work to do in the Garden of Eden. Jesus said, peace, verse 21, peace be with you, as the Father has sent me, I am sending you. They're not replacing Jesus, they are carrying on his work. They are bringing this message of forgiveness, of peace, of belonging to the whole world. You see, what Jesus began was in one place, in Israel. They would continue that work across all nations, across the whole world. What a task. How on earth would they do it? How would they be equipped? They are, they are weak and fearful. Well, they would be equipped in the same way that Jesus was. Jesus ministered in the power of the Holy Spirit. And that is what he gives them here. The word for breath and spirit are the same. So when it talks about Jesus breathing out here, it is symbolic of the spirit, the Holy Spirit that the disciples will be filled with a few weeks later at Pentecost. That would happen after Jesus had ascended, after he was no longer with them. That is when the spirit comes. But what Jesus is doing here reminds us of creation, doesn't it? When God breathes into Adam. God breathed into Adam, gave him life. So Adam was made as the image of God. 
Adam was given this task of being God's deputy and ruling over creation, of starting in that garden and, and uh, spreading that really to the rest of the world. Well, here the disciples are filled with the Spirit of God so that they can sort of image the Son of God, that they can continue his work of bringing words of forgiveness, life-changing, life-creating words to the world, words that will transform the world. Something greater than the task that Adam had. So the Spirit gives life, just as he did in creation. And we are here today as a result. You know, part of the evidence that Jesus is alive is that millions of people down history who have not, um, who have not seen him and haven't simply admired him as a dead teacher, but people who have met him as a living saviour. That is evidence that Jesus is alive. How on earth did the church grow with a message that centred on Jesus being alive if the body was still there, if Jesus was actually dead, if no one ever encountered him again. But the reality is this is what has happened. The church has spread across the world, just as Jesus said, there has been transformation. People have discovered the, the forgiveness, the transformation that comes from meeting Jesus through his word. And that, to me, that's something that, that encourages me in my own faith. Sometimes, you know, you doubt and you think, well, can I really believe this stuff? You know, is this real? It doesn't feel very real to me at the moment. <laughs> Our feelings are so, um, so strong, aren't they? And sometimes what helps me is thinking, well, it's been true for them. You know, I heard their testimony of what Jesus has done. Yeah, I, I guess this is real. And that has helped me and encouraged me in my own faith. So these are words of transformation. There's lots of words this morning. What, what, what are we meant to do with them? This is where we finish. They are words to obey. See, in verses 30 and 31, John is almost stepping outside his account and he's addressing you, the reader, directly. Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus <coughs> is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life <coughs> in his name. John is addressing you directly. No, God is speaking to you today. God is calling you by name, just as he did for Mary, because he wants you to do something. The gospel is not a sort of novel to enjoy and then put down again and forget. It's more the announcement of a cure for a deadly disease. These signs that John talks about, they're not there to make you just go, wow, that's exciting. They're meant to point you to Jesus, that Jesus is the saviour that you need. And it's a massive mistake to ignore his words because they are the words of the creator. They are the words of God. Thomas gets this, doesn't he? What does he say? My Lord and my God. Thomas now believes. Jesus is, <coughs> Jesus is the Son of God who returns to my Father. Jesus is the one who sends God the Holy Spirit. Who can send God but God? You see, there is one God who is Father, Son and Spirit in this eternal union of love. And we see this God, all of God, as we look at Jesus. That's why he's called the word. He reveals God. He is the creator. He made everything. He is the source of life. And it is his words, God's words, that we have been hearing this morning. We have been hearing the words of the one who made us, the one who knows us. Surely we should listen. No, we should obey. 
We don't just listen. We need to do something. Things didn't end well with our ancestor Adam when he didn't listen to the creator, did they? Not obeying God leads to death. Obeying, believing Jesus' words leads to life. That's the ultimate reason why we should obey. This is, this is for our good. He is not offering something bad. He is offering the very thing that we need. These are words of life. So when he calls Jesus the Christ, it means he is the Messiah. He is the king who has come to rescue. See, Adam was the king who brought death. Jesus is the king who undoes the damage that he brought. That is why the word became flesh. The son of God became a human like us so he could be a human different to us. Someone who perfectly obeyed, someone who served, someone who gave his life as a sacrifice for our sin. So life is found in his name. That means in who he is. It's found by trusting, by believing, by belonging to him, by being called by his name. That's why those who have trusted Christ call themselves Christians, yeah, Christians. We are called by his name. That is ultimately who we are. And belonging to Jesus is true life. Eternal life. This is the life we were made for, to know and to love God, to enjoy God. And actually, it's what we're all looking for, even if we don't realise it. Think back to that advert. We want security. We want fulfilment. But here's the thing. It's not found in independence. It's certainly not found in independence of God. That was precisely where Adam went wrong, wasn't it? The fact is we are the most free and that's really what we're wanting when we say we want independence. We want freedom. We are the most free when we are serving God. So Jesus isn't someone that you add to your life. He's not the sort of icing on your cake there to bless your agenda. A lot of people think of Christianity like this. Yeah, I've got my life and I'll add Jesus on top. Yeah, that's a nice extra addition. It doesn't work like that. He doesn't serve your agenda. He is all of life. You surrender all to him. In fact, your life is his life. It's all or nothing. But he promises life. This is real life. It's an incredible promise, isn't it? It's incredible because the world we live in now seems so far removed from what Jesus is promising. You know, our world now is not even a building site, it's more of a bomb site. In many ways, it feels like there's not a lot of signs of transformation. So how can we believe this? How do we know this is true? How do we know we can trust Jesus' words? Well, it comes back to this greatest sign. It's because he is alive. He has defeated death. New creation has started in his resurrection body. He is the life-giving spirit. That's the evidence that this is true. And if you have trusted him, if you have met the risen Jesus, then spread the word. Say, like Mary, I have seen the Lord. Well, let's testify in our final song, this great hymn of John Wesley. Charles Wesley, sorry. And can it be that I should gain an interest in the Saviour's blood? This is this hymn that speaks the wonder of the salvation that we have in Christ.
Let's pray. Blessed are those who hear the word of God and obey it. What a blessing there is in your word. What a promise, what a gospel, what a saviour. Heavenly Father, impress these realities upon us this morning. Where stuff is maybe familiar to us and yet has never been acted on. We pray, Lord, that you would grant that gift of faith, that gift of repentance, that new birth, to bring about that transformation from death to life amongst us here this morning. Thank you for the new life that is found in Jesus. May we walk in that all our days, for we ask it in his name. Amen.